Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. I invite you to take your Bibles, take a pen, take some copy of the sermon notes, and join me again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. It's very exciting to be able to take some time together and think about the love of God and what it means to love one another. And we're doing that in the context of the passages in the New Testament that tell us to love one another, to do so in humility, with unity, and for service. And we're doing it as we are preparing ourselves in the fall to study 1 Corinthians. Certainly a group of believers who, who really, really struggled to love one another the way God had asked them to love one another. In many ways, they're a church that is quite dysfunctional because they do not know how to love one another. So it's a little bit ironic that in the middle of 1 Corinthians, we have this beautiful chapter about love. And it was included in the letter not because they were super good at it. It was included in the letter because they struggled with it. Listen as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm just going to read the first four verses, and then I'm going to jump down to the end and read verse 13, because I want you to hear again, as we did last week, I want you to hear the preeminence, the preeminence of love in the life of a believer. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, So as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous, does not brag, and is not arrogant. Verse 5 does not be it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Verse 6, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And in the beginning of verse 8, love never fails. And then you go down to verse 13, where we just have the declaration that love is the preeminent Christian ethic. But now abide faith Hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. We talked last week about how this is a real challenge to think about this. Love does not come to us naturally. Our natural bent when we are born is to be selfish. Babies know how to get what they want. They're quite thick. No one has to teach them how to do that. They know how to demand their own way. We have as a default setting, self-centeredness. Our natural bent is to seek self, to satisfy self, to protect self, to be self-seeking. Love is not natural. Therefore, it must be taught. We must be told by God how to love. And the beauty of the one another passages is they give us a wonderful blueprint about how to love one another. They teach us how to do it. And we need that. We desperately need that. In the same way that when God gave the, the law to Moses, Moses came to the people. Did he say to them, you must go and offer sacrifices to the Lord in order for your sins to be atoned? So go offer sacrifices. No. He told them exactly how to do it. He told them what animals to choose. 
He told them what the animal must be like, how old it must be. It must be a male. It must be one year old. It must be without. It must be at least a year old. It must be without blemish. He told them exactly where to do it. He told them to whom they were to bring the sacrifice. And then he told the people to whom the sacrifice was brought, namely the Levitical priests, he told them exactly what to do, what instruments to use to slay the lamb, how to drain the blood, into what instruments do you drain the blood, what do you do with the blood, once you killed it, what do you, how do you carve it up, once you carve it up, what do you do with it? They were told specifically. God said, this is what pleases me. Do it this way. I would suggest to you this morning that your love is exactly the same thing. You want to please God? He is going to tell us how to love one another. And of course, the challenge is it may not fit our definition of love. What we call love may not be what the Bible is calling love, in which case we have to do what? Adjust our understanding of love. We have to adjust it. And we're told that it is action. When the Bible uses the word love, it is demonstrable. God demonstrates his love towards us. How? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So this is a marvelous conversation for us to have. As we take instruction from God about how we are to love. Now I told you there are 59 passages that contain the one another command as an imperative and they actually speak to about 35 different types of actions. So we're going to take some time and we're going to look at those very closely. But today we're just going to look at the overarching command to love one another and see if we can glean from that any understanding of how God is defining love. How's he using the term? Is he using it the way they use it in Hallmark movies? Is he using it the way our culture uses it? Is he using it the way of a couple who's been married for a number of years say, we just don't feel it anymore, so we're going to divorce. Is that the way God defines love? So we're going to look today at the overarching command. Then next week, we're going to look about how we do it with humility. The week after that, we're going to look at how we do it in unity. And then the fun begins. Then the real fun begins. Because then we get to spend all of July and almost all of August looking at the specific actions of love. How do I act, how, what am I actually asked to do? To show love. To show a divine love. To show a godly love. So with that in mind, because these passages are all over, I decided that we would go to a rich mine to, do so, to look for these gems. And it turns out that there's several one another passages that have to do with love in John 13. So join me in John 13. We're going to look at John 13 and John 15. And then we're going to look at 1 John, which is just loaded with this one another command to love. Just dripping with it. So if you'll join me in John 13, and we're going to spend most of our time here, but because of the nature, because of the comprehensive nature of this conversation, we're going to look at other passages as well to help us get some insights into why, what's going on in John 13 and 15 and throughout the book of 1 John. John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. I want to just read these to you. Then I'm going to read John 15, 12, and 13, probably 14 as well. And then we're going to talk about the circumstances, what's going on in John 13 and 14 and 15, what's happening, because I think that's pretty important for this conversation. Here's what it says, John 13, 31. Now, therefore, he, that would be a reference to Judas. Now, therefore, Judas, he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. 
You shall seek me. And as I said to the Jews, I now say to you also, where I am going, you cannot come. Verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now skip over to 15, 12, and 13. <coughs> same night, same setting. As you can tell, some of you are, are, are sharp enough to know that we're at the Last Supper. This is literally less than 24 hours before Jesus is going to die. This is the cross. We're in the shadow of the cross. We're there. Verse 12 in chapter 15. This is my, listen how, listen how personal it is. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. So what are the circumstances in which we're having this conversation in John 13, 14, and 15, and into 16? Jesus is imminent death. He is hours away from doing what he came to do. He is hours away from providing the atoning sacrifice that is necessary to save his church. Without it, we are doomed. Without his death, there is no hope for us. Sin must be paid for. Justice demands it. It is absolute prerequisite, an absolute requirement of justice that the sin that we have committed must be paid for and Jesus is about to go pay for it. This is his departure. What are the circumstances in which Jesus gives his command to love? It's his departure. He is leaving. Yes, he's going to die on the next day. He is going to be raised again on the first day of the week. He's going to spend 40 more days with them. And then he is going to ascend to the right hand of the Father, where he is right now making intercession on our behalf. And what does he want to talk about? Of all the things... He wants to talk about you and I loving one another. He said, I'm about to go. And I need you to love one another. And I need you to love one another the way I have loved you. So we're going to just unpack this a little bit as we think about what can we, what understanding of what it means to love one another can we glean from these passages? Well, a few things. I want to suggest to you this, kind of as a spoiler alert. <laughs> I think as we get deeper and deeper into the one another passages, we're going to be given more and more specifics about how to love one another. This is the general umbrella command to love one another. But the specifics, the meat to put on these bones is coming. But I would suggest to you, you can't understand the meat that's going to be put on these bones if you don't understand what he means when he says, I need you to love each other the way I loved you. You've got to understand that first. This is a matter of first importance. And that's why we start here. So that when we start talking about the other things, we don't just speak about them in a, in a vacuum. We talk about them in the way that Jesus wants us to love. So he starts, I mean, let's go, to, let's go back to John 13, verse 34. I just want to look at that, those first couple of words. He says, I give to you a new commandment. That's really curious. You know why that's super curious? Because the, old, the command to love one another is all the way back in the Old Testament. Go with me to Leviticus 19. You know, part of me wants to say, I mean, if I imagine some of the disciples may have been tempted to raise their hand and say, excuse me, Lord, but there's nothing new about that command. That, that command doesn't feel all that new. Leviticus 19, 18. This command is as old as the law of Moses. Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people. There's that one another, the people of God. This is about the people of God and their love for one another. 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Well, that doesn't feel very new. Uh, that's as old as the law of Moses. Deuteronomy 6, 5 uh, tells us to love the Lord our God with all our strength and all our heart and all our mind. That's not very new either. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You know, it's probably a fair question at this point to ask Jesus, in what way is the commandment new? Well, you know what? Everything is about to change. He is 24 hours from going up to Calvary and dying. And you have to understand that at that moment, everything is going to change. It is going to be a dramatic alteration in his people. How big a change is it? The veil in the temple that separated the outer chambers from the Holy of Holies is going to rip in two from the ceiling to the floor. We're about to see a dramatic new way to love one another. And it's going to change. It's going to be new in two respects. This is going to be super new, and it's going to be super new in two respects. It's going to be super new in the means in, available to us to love one another. The thing that makes you and I able to love one another is about to change dramatically. And the model for what, how we are to love one another is, is going to change. Christ himself. So how does the death of Christ make it possible for you and I to love one another? Well, number one, you can see halfway down, about the middle of the blue sheet, that question, how does the death of Christ make it possible for us to love one another? What's new about this? Number one, you in Christ have a, a new divinely created nature. You have a new nature. Remember we talked about how love is not natural? What is, what is our natural setting? Selfishness? Self-centeredness, self-seeking, self-serving, self-gratifying, self-exalting. Christ is going to give us a new nature. And that makes it possible to do the one another passages. We have been given a new nature. A couple of quick stops on this. Verses I hope are super familiar to you, but if they're not, it's, a, it's good for you to get familiar with these. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians. Again, these, this poor Corinthian church, which doesn't know how to love each other, they're getting a lot of crash courses in, in what they need to understand about loving each other. Chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is such a beautiful statement about your new nature in Christ. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, so we're talking about believers. We're talking about those who have been born again, filled with his Holy Spirit. They have been transformed. They have literally been given a new nature. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creature. The old things passed away because new things have come. What is different about this? What is, how is this commandment new? Here's how it's new. You are a new creature now going out to love one another. Never before in history has the Holy Spirit resided like this continually and purposefully in humans for this reason. The death of Christ has transformed us. We are not the same. We are not the same people. We do not care about the same things. We do not want the same things. We do not strive for the same things. Our dreams are not the same. Our aspirations are not the same. We don't have the same set of priorities. We are completely different. Jesus describes us in Matthew 24. He describes us this way. I'll read these to you. Matthew 24 and verse 12. He says, and because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. That is a testimony to our old nature. Your love is going to grow cold unless you are in Christ and made a new creation. And he says it the same thing when he's talking 
uh, in John chapter 5, verse 42, he says, But I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. But once you are in Christ, and you are a new creature, a new creation, you have the love of God in you. And now it is possible to love the way God wants you to love. It's not that our unbelieving, it's not that our unbelieving neighbors and friends and relatives can't be kind to one another from time to time. It's not that they can't show something of kindness and being nice and civil, but they cannot love the way God is going to ask us to love in the one another passages. It is not natural. It's not. It's not natural. Because our nature is to be selfish and look out for number one. Our nature is to love those who love us and to scratch the back of those who can scratch our backs. That's what our nature is. We studied this in Galatians. We listened to how this new nature operates. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, I'm dead. Lee Coggin died in July of 1991. In July of 91, I died. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Same thing is true for those of you in this room who are believers. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. It took his atoning death to make this new nature possible. And then it just says it more plainly, just as plainly in Galatians 5, 22a, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Why? Because it's not natural to my spirit. It wasn't, my spirit was never going to produce this kind of love. My spirit was never going to behave this way. Indeed, indeed, it took my nature being changed forever to enjoy this, to enjoy the ability to do this. What's new about this command is I have a whole new nature. And now I can go love others. And I can do it the way God's going to ask me to do it. You know what? The, it, this really, it's not just a new nature. It's, it's, it's actually more glorious than that. As glorious as that is. It's a new nature. But number two, it's really a new means. It's a new means that empowers me to love others and to do what is right. There's really a whole new source for this love. And quite frankly, the prophets of old talked about it. Jeremiah talked about it. Ezekiel talked about it. I want you to hear them describing this new nature and this new means. Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah 31, listen to what the prophet says beginning in verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is like a new source. This is a new source of where my love is coming from. And they shall not teach again uh, each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more this is a new nature when he talks about putting the law within them and on their heart of course the heart is not referring to the organ which pumps blood through our bodies it's talking about that seat within you where you make decisions that point of decision making in your being where you decide to go left or right you decide to act he says, I'm gonna, he says, I'm taking that up, and I am putting my law right there at that point. 
this is a new nature. This is a new source. God himself is taking command of this. And it is beautiful when it happens in his people. Absolutely beautiful. And quite frankly, folks, it's a force that cannot be stopped. It's an unstoppable force when this happens. Ezekiel says the same thing. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. Ezekiel tells us the same thing. God says, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. That's a new nature and a new source, new means. And I will remove the heart of stone. That's that selfish heart that just wants to seek self. He said, I'm taking that away. That stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And we will finally love the way God is going to ask us to love each other. It's quite beautiful. It's a gloriously unstoppable force. It's fantastic. We have a new nature. We have a new means. We also have a model for what this new love is going to look like. How does the death of Christ model for us how to love one another? Well, let's go back to John 13. I'm going to read, I'm going to read something from John 13, verse 34, and then I'm going to read something from John 15, 12. We just read these, but I just want to remind you. We have a new model. Christ is our model for what this love looks like. This is what it looks like. He says in verse 34, I mean, I'm in John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. How? Even as I have loved you. He says the same thing in John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. And then he adds this piece. Greater love has no one than this that one laid down his life for his friends. This love that you and I are going to see in the one another passages is a love that requires sacrifice. It is a love that requires sacrifice. And quite frankly, beloved, uh, we don't always like that. Let's just be honest with each other. We don't like that. We don't like being inconvenienced. We don't like having to do sacrificial things. I think too often we're a little bit like James and John in Matthew chapter 20. <laughs> James and John in Matthew chapter 20, I'm going to read verses 20 through 28. They are going to get a correction from Christ because they do not understand that love is sacrificial. That the love that God calls you to do, the, call, the thing you and I are called to, to love divinely with this new nature and this new means and this new spirit is a sacrificial love. James and John have been with Jesus for three years and they have not figured this out. In fact, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, James and John have come to Jesus for ask, to ask for the two most powerful positions in his kingdom. This would be like if somebody were running for president and they're in the campaign and somebody comes up to them and says, hey, listen, man, when you get elected, we'd like to be Secretary of State and Secretary of the Treasury. Like the two most powerful cabinet positions. That's what we'd like to be. James and John have literally showed up to ask Jesus. Actually, we know a little bit more about this by reading the other. They actually sent their mother to ask for this. So we get the full picture by reading all four Gospels. But here, uh, yeah, this is the mother coming. Uh, this is the one where the mom comes. Verse 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, came to him with her sons, bowing down and making a request to him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine, that's James and John, may sit, I'm sorry, this is not funny, one on your right and one on your left. Listen to what Jesus says to her in verse 22. You do not know what you are asking. In fact, if you knew what you were asking, you would withdraw the request. Are you ready to come into my kingdom and, be ha and have to love with that kind of sacrificial love? Do you know the sacrifice those who are mine are going to make for one another? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? What cup is he about to drink? Well, he's going to be hauled up a hill, tortured to death, and nailed to a piece of wood. They said to him, we are able. We are able. 
He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, that is not mine to give, but to those, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. You know why they're indignant? Because they're really upset that they didn't ask for it first. They're not indignant because they're thinking, yeah, look at them being so selfish and asking for the seat of authority and power and honor. How, how selfish, James. No, they're indignant because they wish they had asked. But Jesus called himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you, among us. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. There's the sacrificial love. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. There's the sacrificial love. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, here's the model, this is the model, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In Ephesians chapter 5, when, we're told, when those of us who are husbands are told to love our wives as Christ loved the church, you know how we're told that Christ loved the church? He gave his life for her. This is a sacrificial love you are being called to. And quite frankly, uh, we, don't, we don't like it. Love is sacrificial. Listen, if, if my neighbor who lives across the street from me has had surgery on his shoulder because of an injury at work, and he is out in his driveway with eight inches of snow, and he is trying to drag his trash can to the street because he, he, he's only got one arm to do it with, and he's struggling through the depth of the snow. And I am standing in my living room, my warm, toasty living room, with a nice mug of hot chocolate, looking at him going, oh, that poor guy. Man, that, I just, that breaks my heart. Cindy, come look at this. This is just awful. Can you refresh this for me? This got a little cold. I'm sorry, beloved. That is not the love. That is not love. Let me tell you when it becomes love. When I put my coat on and my boots on and my gloves on, and I grab my snow shovel and I go across the street and I clear his driveway and drag the trash cans to the street for him. That's when love shows up. The rest is just empty sentiment. It really is just empty, mush sentiment. It's a Hallmark card. Cindy, we need to send him a card telling him how badly we feel about that. And then I know we're praying for it. No, we need to get out and do it. That's sacrificial. That's when love shows up. Listen, I'm glad God doesn't think that way. How bad would it be for you and me on Judgment Day if we arrive and God says, you know, Lee, I love you so much and I so intended to send my son to die in your place and provide. But you know, things are busy here in heaven and we just couldn't get around to it. So now you are banished to hell forever, but we really do love you. That's a meaningless sentiment. I would suggest to you that love in the Bible is nothing like that. It is nothing like that is sacrificial action. And this is so foreign to our ears, isn't it? A little bit is because our, we've taken love and we've turned it into a really sad, mushy, sentimental Hallmark card. And that's, that's part of the problem. But you know what the other part of the problem is? I think part of the problem is when we were presented the gospel, we were presented it wrong. I think one of the reasons why we don't know how to love each other is that when we were invited to come to Christ, we were not invited the right way. I don't know what it was like for you, but I remember exactly how I was invited to come to Christ. I know the church I was attending. I know the pastor who was preaching. I remember the stuff he told us. And here's what he told me. He told me that if I came to Christ, I would avoid hell. That's great for me. I would get eternal life. That's also really great for me. I would have no more tears. I'm really looking forward to that. Streets of gold to walk on. A glorious choir every day. It was continuous, nonstop talk about what was in it for me. And, that, and it was very emotional. You know, they want you... They, they wanted me to cry when I walked the aisle and came down and professed Christ. 
They wanted it to be emotional. They pushed every emotional button they can push. Let me tell you what nobody told me. Strangely enough, nobody told me all the things that Jesus told me. It took me about two years to figure this out. It took me two years of being a Christian to figure out that a lot of things Jesus said got left out of the invitation to come to him. For example, in Luke 14, Jesus says, if you're going to come to me, count the cost. Uh, I'd say, excuse me, what exactly would that be? I don't remember the pastor calling me to Christ saying anything about my need to count a cost. What? What do you, I'm sorry, excuse me? Can we go back and talk about those streets of gold I get to walk on? No one told me this, but Jesus did. Matthew 5, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you. I'm sorry, when are they going to do that? I, I'm sorry, I, I, I was still thinking about that no more tears and streets of gold and eternal life and avoiding the fires of hell. What's this about? Matthew 10, you will be hated by all on account of me. Nobody told me that when they invited me to Christ. Nobody. John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hates you. Strangely enough, that was not included in the invitation to become a Christian. You know why? Because it was purely emotional. They just wanted to, they wanted to just get me to tears and to come down and cry and sign a card and say a, and say a prayer and then they could count me on their Sunday school role. And nobody told me this. Nobody. Galatians 2.20. I no longer live. And that is why we don't know how to love. That is why our love is mushy sentimentalism. Because the modern gospel has taught us to be mushy and sentimental. When Jesus taught us to be sacrificial. Jesus taught us to give of ourselves the way he gave of himself. On the night before he died, he looked at his disciples and he said, pay attention to what you are about to watch in the next 24 hours because I need you to love each other like that. Watch me. Watch how sac sacrificial I'm going to be. And quite frankly, because we don't teach that, what we end up with is a lot of churches who don't know how to love. And quite frankly, that makes them kind of phony. That makes them phony churches. In fact, maybe not churches at all. So let's turn our attention to the other place where we have a lot of love one another passages in the time we have left. This will take us about five minutes. Go with me to the wonderful, marvelous book of 1 John. Everybody turn there. Everybody go there. It's towards the back of the Bible. You find it after 1 and 2 Peter. Am I right about that? Is it after? Yeah. <laughs> it is after 1 and 2 Peter. <laughs> hey, I don't always get that right. And I want to look at what John has to say to the church about loving one another, about its source and about its means and why we are able to do it at all. But really, you know what I want you to see in 1 John? That this is the indispensable mark of the church. This is the indispensable mark of the church. This is what makes the church the church. This is what makes us authentic believers. We'll start in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you. Well, that sounds familiar. I just heard Jesus say, 
that he has a new command. He says, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 6. On the other hand, he says in verse 8, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true, how? In Christ, in him, and in you. See, this is a new nature, a new spirit. It is in us. This is what's new about it. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. I want to make sure you don't miss this. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, if you claim to be a Christian and you don't love the way God has commanded you to love, you are not a Christian. It's just talk. It's empty talk. The one, verse 10, the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is an indispensable measure of your authenticity as a follower of Jesus Christ. This is the sign that you're the real deal, is that you are going to live the one another passages John, 1 John 3.11 For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should what? Love one another. He stays in that same chapter. and goes down to verse 23. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. Look at the link between faith and loving one another. It's an indispensable marker. It gives us a way. Remember, Jesus said, this is how people will know you're my followers. Jesus just said it in John 13. He said, the way they're going to know you're a Christian is how you love one another. That's how they're going to know. Go to chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What is the source of all this? God in you. You're born of God. You're born new in Christ. You're a new creature. You are born again. And you are born to love other believers. You are born for this. Verse 11 in chapter 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What's our model? The sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. You have to, you have to love in a sacrificial way. It's going to cost you to do this. Chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. You love the church. You love others in the church because Christ loved them. Verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, it says in verse 3, that we keep his commandments and his his commandments are not burdensome. This is a labor of love. Well, it's an interesting challenge, isn't it? To realize that the way you and I love one another is the way that you know that we are in Christ. And it's not just any way. It's not just any old way. We have to love one another the way Christ has commanded us. So I have this these series of questions that I'm going to ask throughout the next couple of months and probably into 1 Corinthians as well. This is a pretty serious question. Does Calvary Bible Church have a one another culture? It's a rhetorical question. I just want you to think about it. As we go through these two months and we look at these one another passages, we are going to have to ask ourselves some pretty tough questions. Do we have a one another culture? Next question. How are we acting together to build a one another culture? Another question. Are the things we consider acts of love to one another confirmed by Scripture as love? If we were to say, well, yes, we love one another, and here's what I'm doing, but we're neglecting what God asks us to do as love, and these things aren't even on the list of things that God asks us to do as love, are we willing to change? Are we willing to jettison what we defined as love and replace it with what God has asked us to do? 
And finally, if we are in fact loving one another, how are we encouraging more acts of love? Beloved, I think every church in the United States needs to start asking itself this question. I wonder if you went to people and said, hey, what is the mark that you are the actual church of Jesus Christ? I wonder what they would say. And listen, I know, I know what some, some might say to me. They say, well, listen, Lee. Jesus said, I will build my church and it will stand against the gates of hell. I want to tell you this morning, I do not doubt that for one second. I understand that Jesus' church is an unstoppable force. That's not the question. The question is, are we Jesus' church? That's the question. That's the challenge. Is he commanding and controlling what our priorities are? Are we organizing ourselves and doing what he has asked us to do? Because if we aren't doing it his way, we will be steamrolled. It doesn't say that just anybody who shows up and calls himself a Christian will stand against the gates of hell. It's very personal. He said, my. He said, my church will be an unstoppable force. Not just a bunch of people who call themselves a church. Are we a church? And if so, what makes us a church? Is it this giant wooden pulpit? Is it the fact that we use a wooden pulpit? Does that make us a church? Does it? Listen, we got a scrap of paper from the IRS in here in a file folder that says we're a church. Well, if the IRS says you're a church, you must be a church, right? Of course, they also say the Church of Satan in Oklahoma City is a church, so I'm not so sure they're the best measure of this. We have a cross on our steeple. We have an organ. We do have an organ. Does that make us a church? Is that the thing that makes us a church? I would submit to you this morning that none of those things are what makes us a church. It's our, do we have a one another culture? That's the thing that makes us the church of Jesus Christ that will stand against the gates of hell. So on a scale to one, on a scale from one to ten, with ten being that we are actively pursuing and practicing all 59 one another passages, and one being we're just sort of in a place where people come to get an informational speech at 10:30 on Sunday morning, and then they go their separate ways. Where do we rank? I know Jesus' church will stand against the gates of hell. I'm just wondering if Calvary Bible Church is that proper church. This is not a childish question to ask. This is not a childish question to ask. This is a serious adult question to ask. And quite frankly, I think every church in America should be asking this. Because we live in a culture which is literally burning down around us. And I would suggest to you that if we, if we can insert a proper, fully formed, one another culture, we would become an unstoppable force for, for good and for God. So are we doing a lot of stuff that just proves we think we're smarter than God? Or are we doing the things that he is asking us to do that equal loving one another? Well, I think we're going to talk about humility next week, then we'll talk about unity, and then we'll get into what I think is really going to be the really encouraging part of this is when we look at the things we are actually supposed to be doing. And then we can really roll up our sleeves and get to work. So let's pray to that end. But Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much the, for the love, a sacrificial love, that without, without that sacrificial love, we would be doomed. We would be lost. But we need to confess to you this morning if we are not loving that way, if we are not loving one another, we need to confess it, and then we need to repent, and we need to correct it. So, Lord, I pray that throughout the next couple of months and into our study of 1 Corinthians that you would indeed teach us how to love one another. Where there are snippets and where this is happening, Lord, bless it and encourage it and help it to grow stronger. Where it is not happening, help us to repent from that neglect and to start doing it. 
Grant to us a godly love for one another. Grant to us the gift of a love for one another that will make our love a pleasing aroma to you in heaven. Where you can point to us and say, there go my people. Have you considered my people at Calvary Bible? Have you, cons- have you seen their love for one another? Have you seen its humility? Have you seen its unity? Have you seen its practice and its action? That's the people we want to be. Lord, help us to be that kind of people. Help us to bring honor and glory to your name in the way that you have asked us to bring honor and glory to your name. Not just any old way, but with a sacrificial love that flows one to another and does so for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, let's stand together at our closing hymn. Dale and the musicians will come and lead us. Let's sing together. Let's sing, We Are One in the Barn of